in honor of my father, Charles Martin Foyer Batal ben Abram. He was born in 1946 in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he died um, in Cleveland, Ohio on December 1st, 1999, uh, age 53. That's Kafet Kislev Tafshin Samech, which for those of you who, who want to know, yes, indeed, it is right now his, his yard site. I want to take a couple of minutes just to say a few things about my dad. Um, and I, I want to introduce some other stuff that's happening in general, and then I want to dive into Hanukkah and this whole question of freedom, which to me is actually a pressing question not just in Hanukkah, but in the world in which we live today. So first, uh, my father. You know, every year I say different things, although it kind of all amounts to the same thing. And when I was thinking about what to say this year, what came to me was his tremendous love of life. I encourage you guys all to take a look at the pictures that you'll see out there. Um, in every single one of them, you can just see the chain, you see his smile. Um, and of course, okay, you're taking pictures, everybody smiles, but he kind of looked like that all the time unless he was sleeping. Um, and even then, my brother and I have spoken about it, he had this like, kind of mischievous sleep grin that you never knew whether he was actually asleep or he was just like on the couch, leave me alone, my eyes are closed. Um, so the reason I mentioned it is because he had really, I think, the source of his joy was a hopeful eye. He had a hopeful eye, and an eye for the potential that the future held. My mom loves to say that every time things were looking grim financially or in some other way, he would always kind of have this sense of, yeah, but you never know what's just around the corner. Right? And, and, and it carried them through what were more than 30 years of, uh, uh, of a beautiful marriage, which, you know, neither my brother nor I were particularly easy children, so it wasn't all roses. Um, but I really believe that that type of hopeful eye, that ability to see the potential in things, is, is two things. It's a tremendous source of freedom. Because there's no greater source of slavery than our belief that what was dictates what will be. Right? This sense of a, a mechanistic existence that as if I could just reel my life backwards, and if I could just fix something in the past, things would be okay now, but since I can't, I'm just playing it all out. I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way, but it is a true slavery to our own conceptions, and therefore a hopeful eye that's able to see the potential of what is not yet is a tremendous source of freedom. And that's why I actually think that this is what Reb Shlomo calls Mashiach eyes. Right? Being able to see that which is not yet. And of course, if you are a parent, a friend, a loved one, uh, a child, a teacher, then you know that the power of seeing the good in someone is a power of bringing it to be. And so I can really say that my father, um, he saw my potential. And I know from speaking to any number of young men who are actually much younger than I am now, whatever, 20s and 30s um, who worked with him, worked for him. He was a manager who helped um, entrepreneurs, technological entrepreneurs, build a business structure. And his art form as a manager, as I've heard again and again from people that work for him, was the first question he always asks is, well, what can you do? Meaning, we'll get to what I need you to do. I understand my business structure, but first let's talk about what you can do. Because you just never know. And like, you know, you hear from managers all the time right now that a mechanistic approach to employees is a dead end, right? You don't want to just plug people into your system as if they are cogs in the machine. You want to bring out their potential. So I just want to honor him in that feeling that um, he saw my potential, and I'm at a point in my life right now um, where I really feel like I'm doubling down on where that potential needs to go. And so in that, I bet you didn't know it, but you all came to a party. The, the wine and donuts weren't just for the sake of Hanukkah. This is the Jewish Story Podcast pre-launch party. Everyone go, we. So, so what's the Jewish story? So what's the Jewish story? A lot of you I know are actually already listeners. Um, if you're not or if you are, you have no idea what I'm talking about. In short, it's me telling a very old story in a very new way. Right? And, and what it's about is a grounding in the past and a hopeful and healing perspective on the future. And if you listen to it, what I'm offering you is momentum that comes from understanding your context of how you came to be and the clarity that comes from knowing your aims. Right? Because, of course, the Baal Shem Tov says that the secret of redemption is memory. So I want to invite you all. I wrote up here because in my high-tech fashion, I figured that this was the best way to go about it. Um, the new website, um, and I want to thank Josh and Nikki, who raised their hands, 
for, for doing amazing work. <laughs> Under Aton's incredible captain ship, Captain Re, Captain Captain Dude, um, uh, of getting the logo done. You take a, take a look on the website there. It's really beautiful. Uh, if you want, I'm sure that uh, Hoop will be glad to explain the deep Kabbalistic meaning behind it. Um, so you can take a look at the website. If you go to the website, what I would ask you to do, if you take a few minutes, is go to the iTunes link on the website. Even if you're already a listener, subscribe, you can rate, you can review. What we're trying to do is actually get that up front so that people who don't already know about the Jewish story will see it. Um, also, just as long as I'm going to do the full-on plug, if you want to be a patron, you want to make history happen, you can check out my Patreon page here. If you're already a patron, God bless you, you may actually have incentives coming to you. I put up a whole new structure on the page. Check it out. Just by going there, I can't get your credit card that easily, so don't be nervous. Right? And last but certainly not least, this is what really matters. This is the pre-launch party because the guys came out on a Thursday night, which I'm really, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and we're going to get to the, the bulk of the program momentarily, but if you came out now, that means that you're willing to invest. If you'd like to be part of the launch, which is going to involve me producing content and getting out there for people to share it, um, you can send me an email at robmike at thejewishstory.co. All you have to do is put in the subject line, I'm in, or like launch team, or something to that effect, and I will, I will put you in the list to get the content first. With the hope that, of course, you'll help to shed, to shed, to spread and share it. Spreading and sharing together is shedding, right? That's what cats do. Okay, <laughs> enough of this. We can have questions at the end. So, Hanukkah. I love Hanukkah. It's, it's without a question, my most mm -hmm. favorite holiday. And in many ways, largely because it's so attached to my father's death. One of my most powerful memories, actually, from sitting Shiva was having Hanukkah candles in a Shiva house. And we had little kids there, um, so singing the songs in the Shiva house, to me, represents the power of light and darkness, which is so much of what this story is about. But I don't want to start there, because I promise you guys a question. And the question is, is Hanukkah the festival of freedom? Now, just by asking it, what would most of you say in our calendar is the festival of freedom? Pesach. Pesach, right? So, like, what are we doing talking about freedom on Hanukkah? And I want to start in Pesach to borrow a structure. And I want to demonstrate to you, hopefully, that that structure is universal and actually finds its most potent expression in Hanukkah. In doing that, I want to ask the question, what is freedom? Because we live in a world today where the old models of freedom have begun to break down, as we'll touch on as we go along. And yet I have not yet seen a compelling, positive vision of freedom that's able to push back the darkness of nihilism and meaninglessness and to hold off this sort of psychological blanket of fascism that people are always reaching for. And so it's a small task, but that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. <laughs> so Pesach, not Hanukkah, Pesach has a, a well-known structure which is basically moving from Chofesh to Cherut. Right? The two words in Hebrew that are most associated with freedom are Chofesh and Cherut. And what they mean, it, we'll speak about in a second, usually it's moving from Pesach to Shavuot. Right? Hopefully we're all familiar with the Jewish calendar. Right? You start out with the Exodus and, you know, ten plagues, smashing the Egyptians out through the Red Sea, birthed literally through the Red Sea into the wilderness, and then on to Sinai. What are you going to do with that freedom? Right? So then we get the Torah there. It's very neat. Right? Freedom, we call it in English, liberation, freedom from the Egyptians, and true freedom, freedom of this is what you get to do, the Torah. I mean, we'll talk in a minute or two about the problem of what you get to do is a whole lot of laws, right? We'll get there. Um, but that structure, I think, can teach us a number of things. And I want to take a few minutes to define the words Chofesh and Cherut, and then we'll roll them over into the Hanukkah story. So Chofesh is a biblical Hebrew word, right? And nevertheless, it's not as common as one might think. And if you look for its origins, anybody know in the Hebrew Bible what the origins of Chofesh are? David Swidler. David Swidler is not the origin of Chofesh, although I know. he can't be here tonight. I spoke to him about it, and he answered, of course, immediately. He asked me what the shear was about. Um, so if you don't know David Swidler, you should. It's worth it. Preoccupiedterritory.com or .com. .com. Check it out if you want to laugh at some Middle Eastern satire. Um, so the, with Baogadush. So the word Chofesh shows up first at the beginning of Parsha Mishpatim. It's in Shmot, in Exodus, in chapter 21. And Mishpatim begins with the laws of slavery. 
right? And you get a, a remarkable repetition of this word, kofesh, in the first line of the chapter, right? These are the, the judgments you should set before them. The first din you get is when you buy a Hebrew slave, it will serve for seven years, and then he goes out, chofshi chinam. So we get right away a sense that what chofesh is, is the opposite of slavery, right? Chofesh, and, and, and it's a little bit strange, thank God, in our societies where we don't live in a, at least, um, avowedly slave-using society. We don't have to go into the modern versions of slavery because they're certainly quite present. Nevertheless, the idea of purchasing another human being, for those of us sitting in this room, is something that we would like to fight against and eradicate in the world as a whole and certainly don't tolerate within our societies. Nevertheless, that was not so for most of history, right? And the idea of the status, you are either free or a slave. You notice that that's a negative definition of freedom. It doesn't tell you what you get to do. I guess it tells you what you are free from. Because the Torah's whole perspective is one of obligation and binding relationships. And chofesh means you are not bound to the mastery of another human being. Right? Just as a working definition. By the way, this idea of negative freedom is quite common in Western culture. You, you can trace the arc of the development of freedom in Western culture through modernity as a progressive breaking of the bonds, right? Breaking of the bonds of a guild structure in economics, breaking of the bonds of religious communities to control your life, breaking of the bonds of oppressive governments, right? But the, the, there's two problems that come with that. One is what Eric Fromm calls the problem of freedom. See, when you break away from all of these bonds which are really contexts within which you're embedded, you know what the result of freedom is, says from? Loneliness. Yeah, it's terrifying. Because humanity in the Middle Ages were embedded in a structure which allowed every individual to know who they were. Right? I am a Jew. I am a Christian. I am a, I don't know, a, a weaver. I am a townsman. I am a husband. You understand? That, that, that when we speak about the, the rise of individuality in modernity, what we're speaking about is the shattering of all the collective identities that bound every individual. I mean, because the individual isn't new, right? The unit of measure of a human being. Is, there's no such thing as a society, right? Everybody raise your hand if you're a society, right? <laughs> well, you're a planet unto yourself. But um, <laughs> So, nevertheless, what we speak about the advent of individualism with modernity. And what we mean is the progressive breakdown of all these contexts which bound the individual. And it's very appealing. I mean, who wants to be bound, right? Nevertheless, what Frum points out is it comes at a tremendous price. Because what you receive from being bound is an identity that locates you and grounds you in the world. And what happens when you destroy all those things is you're lonely. Right? And that loneliness happens on two fronts, by the way. There's a psychological process which happens from birth, right? It's differentiation of selfhood. If you're familiar with Freud's writings, this is why Freud speaks about the desire to go back to the womb in what he calls the oceanic consciousness, right? This sense that I'm, no, I'm not other than, that very comforting. If you've ever sat in a hot bath and closed your eyes and just let it go, then you know what Freud's oceanic consciousness is. Right? That, that desire, in many ways in our tradition, of course, is rooted where? Where is the recognition that it's a bad situation to be alone located in Jewish tradition? Right. The Lotov. The first place that the Bible ever mentions that something could not be good, it's to be alone. And you can trace the story of Breshit as this struggle between the desire to liberate and be myself and the need to ameliorate the pain of loneliness that goes with it. I highly recommend, by the way, Fromm's Escape from Freedom. It's a book which can illuminate many of the challenges we face as a society today. That's on the psychological or perhaps you know, the textual spiritual level, but just sociologically, like I said, this, the, 
the advent of the individual as the unit of measure for society comes together with the destruction and deconstruction of all those economic, social, and cultural frames that used to ground us and give us a sense of warm hug or you know, choking embrace, which is why in the end so many people wanted away from it. But the failure to substitute anything is what allowed capitalism to turn the human being into a resource. If you've ever read Marx's Alienation of Labor, which if you have not, if you're going to read anything by Marx, that's what you need to read, right? To understand what happened to the human being through this process of monetization, uprooting from all the contexts that gave us a sense of self that was grounded, left vulnerable the vast majority of people without the sort of wealthy elite's ability to now exercise this new freedom in ways that we'll speak about. And so what happens to them? They just get sucked into the machine without the protection that was provided to them by religion, guild, class, status, with all of the, the downsides. I'm not looking to go back to the Middle Ages, but just be aware of what's happened. Okay, so that, that's chofesh, negative freedom. It's freedom from. What's cherut? By the way, cherut in the Bible, where does it appear? It does not. It does not, right? We had this discussion, right? It does not appear there, although, we can get a sense, it's, it's a rabbinic language. The, the sages, and, and we, we see it in our liturgy, as we'll get to in a moment, right? It's certainly a very Jewish word, don't be nervous, right? Um, it, interestingly enough, shows up in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel as a primary Jewish value, even though it's not a biblical one, which is, deserves some attention, right? Um, but we know what the sages thought cherut was, because even though the word cherut doesn't actually show up in the Bible, there's a very close version of it which is Harut, Yoshua. Where is it? Harut al-Luchot. That's right. If you look in Shmot in 32, 16, right? The, the, the tablets that Moshe got were, were the product of God's work. And the writing was a godly writing. Hu Harut al-Haluchot. It was engraved on the tablet. And the sages have a very well-known drasha. Don't read it as charut. Ela charut. Rather as freedom, because there's no one who's so free as one who learns the Torah. Now, we're going to pursue this notion, because, of course, it is always a challenge when you learn the Pesach story. We are going to talk about Hanukkah, don't be nervous, but Pesach provides the frame. It's always a challenge when you learn the Pesach story. What are we trying to get away from in Pesach? Slavery. What do we become by the end of the story? Abadim. Abadim. Right? We were Abadim to Paro, and now we're going to be Ov De Hashem. But there's a very important difference. And it's the difference between service and servitude. Right? It was servitude to Paro. And we were brought out from Egypt to Sinai to do divine service. And the question is since we got our Hofesh from Paro, we got our freedom. What is the cherut, the actual freedom of positive sense? We are liberated from power. We're free at Sinai. What does it look like? And what can it teach us about how we might choose to live our lives today? So before we quite go there, there's just a couple of points that need to be made. First of all, there's an important modern lesson. I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I'm willing to bet that many of you find laws restrictive. Right? And furthermore, without even getting into a religious discussion, maybe you have some feelings about structural violence, structural racism, inequalities that are built into the societies in which we live, very real issues. <clears throat> Nevertheless, or I would say yes and, it's important to remember that there is a false opposition between law and freedom. It's a false opposition, I can prove it to you very easily in history, because every freedom that you cherish came to you because of a society of law. I'll say it again. Every freedom that you cherish came to you because of a society of law, even if that society is still restricting some element of freedom that you deem to be sacred. Prove and it. And oi vavoy, what? Prove it. Prove it? Yeah. Name a freedom. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech up until the United States Constitution, actually not even the Constitution, the... the the, uh, what's it called? The, all those amendments are called the Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights, thank you. I was a setup to see if you're paying attention. Um, 
such a thing didn't exist. And by the way, it doesn't exist in most Western countries as a formal law. It is a value of democratic society. But for most of history, by the way, freedom of speech was seen to be actually the enemy of government. And in many, it still is. What else? You want to try me again? Or should we play this game? Now, I want you to think about it. Because despite the very serious truth of the limitations of law and the problems of structural inequality, without law, there is no such thing as enshrining freedom. There's only might makes right. And we know how that goes in the world. It doesn't tend to lend itself to diversity and universal freedom. So that's one piece to think about as we go forward. The other piece to think about is that, that when we talk about harut, engraved on the luchot being harut, being freedom, I want you to know that the service of God, of Vodat Hashem, is conscious action. And halakha, Jewish law, is a behavioral system that is meant to embody your values and the modes of relationship that emerge from it that allow you to take conscious action. Right? This is, by the way, what I like to think of as the hot lasagna problem. Some of you know what it is, but it's always worth reviewing. Just imagine you were walking down the street carrying a hot lasagna. Big tray, hot lasagna, going to visit a friend. And your pants start to fall down. <laughs> now, you got only one of two choices. And whatever you may have thought you thought about public nudity or wasting food up to now, you're about to find out what you really believe. And if you haven't embodied your beliefs and values in a behavioral system that has trained you to make a good decision, what you're probably going to end up with is a big mess and your pants around your ankles. Because most people balk when they're forced to make a decision if they haven't thought it through beforehand. And so the power of law in general, and I would say halakha in particular, is that it is a behavioral system that will allow you to embody your values and the modes of relationship that emerge from them. So just remember, when you're walking down the street with that lasagna, think it through. So, so we have now two pieces. I would call them the poles of freedom. And we have a problem, which is that how do we move between the negative chofesh, the potentiality of freedom, and the positive expression of freedom, which we call cheru, right? How do we go from freedom from to freedom of? I mean, the, the, the story of Pesach is great. I mean, how do we do it? There was a pillar of fire in front of us, and we were walking after it, and Moshe was shepherding us along. And by the way, it still wasn't simple, right? What we're going to see in the Hanukkah story is that that is the dicey moment, that there's something that lies between Chofesh and Cherut, which is the moment of great potential and potentially great disaster, right? What is the point between liberation and freedom? What's the point between liberation and freedom in the, in the Pesach story? Splitting the Red Sea, right? The Red Sea lies between the Exodus and Sinai, right? And by the way, why was it that we saw the great hand of God specifically at the Red Sea? We say it all every day in our davening. Right? That's where we saw the great hand. But ten plagues was not the great hand. Death of the firstborn. I mean, smash the greatest material empire that the ancient world had ever known. Like, why now? In order to answer it, I want to share a thought with you. I've shared it with some of you before, but, you know, review is also good. From Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was a Brazilian educator in the 70s. He was part of the, um, not really the uh, liberation theology movement, the liberation education movement, Marxist thinker. That's why I would box him out of the theological realm. But nevertheless... Freire was in Brazil trying to figure out a fundamental problem of human psychology, which is we all know that oppressed peoples, when they are liberated, when they gain their chofesh, more often than not, recreate the systems of oppression which they have escaped within their own societies. And Freire was not going to accept this. And as a Marxist, he had to come up with some aspect of, hu of structural human nature that will allow him to understand it. He came up with a brilliant observation. He says that the oppressed live a dual existence. They live their own existence as the oppressed, and they live a hope for freedom. It's beautiful, right? The problem is, because oppression is a condition of narrowness, a denial of information, a, de uh, a, a narrowness of experience, most often what does freedom look like for the oppressed? The oppressor. 
when you're a slave, freedom is to hold the whip hand. And you don't really think about all that much more. And so, he points out, that as soon as you gain negative freedom, it is almost inevitable that you will step into the role of oppressor, because that's the only way you know how to exercise your freedom. It's worth it, by the way, to read The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Freire if you want to understand how we can change that. And I happen to think that it's quite an important tool for our people at this time. But we we'll, won't go into that for right now. I think you could probably figure it out. And I'll make it obvious by the end if I don't. So for our story, though, what happened? What was the Yad Gedola that, that Am Yisrael saw there at Yom Suf? It wasn't the splitting of the sea. What was it that they saw? We say it every morning you, if you indulge in the traditional liturgy. The oppressor is drowning in the sea. That's it. They're dead bodies. Th and you know what it means? This is a dead end, people. You see where it leads? It's not enough just to get out of Egypt and leave them behind. Like the Midrash says, the people were afraid, right? They pop up here. They pop up there. Why? Because we carry the oppressor with us. There has to be a moment that you see in your freedom that the oppressor is gone. That it's a dead end. And if you want to truly be free, now you have to choose something else. But this is a very difficult task. By the way, what does Am Yisrael do when they see in this moment? What do they do? They sing. They sing. And this takes us to one other word, which means freedom in the Hebrew language, in Biblical Hebrew. What's the other word that's used for freedom in Biblical Hebrew? You don't hang out with enough Israelis. Dror, right? Dror is a word for freedom. And where does it show up? You know show up? Yovel. Yovel, right? In the Jubilee, right? You should sanctify the 50th year and declare freedom throughout the land, unless you thought that let freedom ring throughout the land was not a biblical quote, right? For all its inhabitants, it's a yovel, it's a jubilee. Everybody go back to your portion and everybody back to their <coughs> family, right? It's the ultimate return to place of origin, to essential self, right? All the compound relationships and the fragmentations that take us away from who we are, we hit the restart button. And you want to know a beautiful thing? When you look in the Ibn Ezra, and he wants to explain to you, what's this word dror mean? He says the following. He says, Yiduhu shehu kemo chofshi. He says, it's, everybody knows, this is like chofshi, but it's a different word. Chofshi happened when we left Egypt. We got negative freedom. We were liberated from. Cherut, the freedom of, will happen at Sinai. What happens here at Yamsuf is dror. And what does he say? It's like chofshi. Like you're free to fly. Listen to this. You know, a songbird, a little bird sings when it's in its own domain, when it is free. But if it's in, under the mastery of a human being, meaning it's not free, you won't eat until he dies. It's Birds only sing when they're free, he says. And there's something about Duro, which is representative of that place between, of negative freedom, the freedom, liberation, freedom from, and this positive choosing of Cherut, the freedom of. There's that moment of song that lies between that can save us from enslaving ourselves right away to something new. Now, if you think about it, there was a tremendous openness to receive a free consciousness that happened at the splitting of the Red Sea. I mean, just look at the events that happened fast and furious right after. You have, you have it, Mara, if you're familiar with Mara and the story of the Chok and Mishpat. You also have the Mana. You have Amalek. It's like boom, 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 boom. And then you're at Sinai. This is the most condensed and impressive, in the literal sense of making an impression, section of the, whole, of the journey in the wilderness. It's because we're completely ready to receive. Not only are we freed from, we are ready to, for, to be free of. And, and we're in that state of dror. Everything is returned to a harmonious song existence, which is ready to find expression. So now we have a structure. 
and I want to apply it to Khan. Questions or comments briefly before we, before we move on there? All right, you can catch me later. I, I know that some of you are probably wondering what I'm talking about, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so we have these terms, Chofesh, Cherut, and Dro in the middle. What does it have to do with Hanukkah? Well, first of all, you know, when you look at the book of Maccabees, what's Hanukkah about? The altar people, it's about the altar. It's about the altar, they fought their way into Jerusalem and onto the Temple Mount in order to rededicate the altar. And they don't give it a name. The first name that we encounter for Hanukkah is actually in Josephus. Josephus, great historian of the end of the Second Temple period, first century of the Common Era, wrote a number of works, and one of them is the Antiquities of the Jews. And there, he points out, now Judas celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifice of the Temple for eight days. Straight line, he was, by the way, a descendant of the Hasmonean house, so he knew the history and he was very proud of that. But he says the following, he says, they had unexpectedly regained the freedom of their worship. Now, it's written in Greek, so I can't tell you which type of um, freedom he's referring to, but, and from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it lights. I suppose the reason was, he says, because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us, and thence was the name given to that festival. Josephus is the first one to call any association of lights to Hanukkah, which I don't want to burst your bubble, but if you're unaware, the, the little pach shemen, little what a cruise of oil, right, and the burning candles of eight days do not appear in the Book of Maccabees. They don't appear in Josephus, who certainly would have told you the story since he was quite proud. They don't appear in the Rishalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud. In fact, it only appears in the Babli tradition in the Gemara and Shabbos. Also in what's called the Scolion of the Megillatani, but likely that was written after. <coughs> so there's different traditions, but what's fascinating is that Josephus calls it lights. But he calls it lights because of liberty. And the question is why? Well, now, first of all, to him it's clearly a story of freedom and liberty, meaning they were liberated from the Greeks and now free to worship in the temple, and it should not be discounted that that was indeed what the holiday was about for many centuries, even after the temple was destroyed. And don't forget this also, that he lived under the Roman occupation and witnessed the Romans' destruction of the second temple. And you may not know that in his generation and the generation before him, Hasmonean was a synonym for, synonym for rebel. All you needed was like one Hasmonean and two angry Jews, and you had a revolt. It's like you put a Hasmonean in a room with a couple of people, it was pow! It, it was gonna, that's why Herod killed like everyone he could, including his own wife and many of his descendants, because they were Hasmoneans. And he feared the fact that they were seen as legitimate source of sovereignty in Am Yisrael. So lighting a candle in the window in, in the window in the memory of the Hasmonean victory was also an act of sticking it to Rome. So, so for Josephus, we have freedom liberated from the Greeks, Chovesh, freedom to worship in the temple. Hey, it's very simple. The connection between light and liberty is going to have to wait. Now, if we scroll way forward and you go to the Rambam, and we, we haven't talked about it now, but it's always worth it to remember that the storytelling is a critical element of Hanukkah. Everybody's got a story to tell. It's unlike any other holiday. You wanted the story of Pesach, everybody agrees. You want the story of Pesach, where do you go to? The Haggadah. And there may be detailed differences, but no one's telling a fundamentally different story. But the Rambam, in Hilchot Megillah in Hanukkah, third chapter, first halacha, if you want to look it up, he tells his story about the Greeks in power, and they forbid us to learn Torah, and it was mean and nasty, and they did all these awful things. Then the God of our fathers took pity, saved and rescued them from the hands of the tyrants. The Hasmonean great priests won victories, they defeated the Syrian Greeks, and set up a king from their power. Liberation from the Greeks. Everybody agrees on that part, but watch this. What did they do with their freedom, according to the Rambam? They set up a king from among the priests, and Israel's kingdom was restored for a period of more than two centuries until the destruction of the Second Temple. It's interesting, he's telling a different story. It's not about liberation from the Greeks, freedom to worship in the temple like Josephus, or like the Book of Maccabees. It's about liberation from the Greeks, freedom to set up a kingdom. Now this is a freedom we know. We know this freedom as a people, and we know it as a, as an, as a, a phenomenon of the modern era. We'll get to postmodern freedom maybe at the end if I, if I get you there, right? National self-determination, right? Raise your hand if you are a nation. Right? You don't have to, right? Um, it's, it, it's one of the hallmarks of modernity. 
and with all its beauty and danger. Right? And the Rambam, interestingly enough, if you can do the math, when he says that this kingdom lasted for more than two centuries, that means he's including Herod. It seems to be including Herod Agrippus, depending on how you want to do the math. He's including Alexander Yana. If you're not familiar with these people, just think mean, nasty kings. Some of them who weren't Jewish. At least not in the eyes of the Jews that they ruled. What's he doing? Telling me two, that this is what we're celebrating on Hanukkah? 200 years of mean, nasty kingship? With a bright spot at the beginning. So we, we know from the book of Maccabees that this was a concern, right? And I told you that, or maybe I didn't tell you, maybe I told some of you, I don't remember who I told what to anymore anyway, right? That one of the primary questions of Hanukkah is how is it that these noble freedom fighters, you know, waging war for religious liberty, for God and country, became petty Hellenistic despots within a generation or two. You got a question already? I think you might have said like 20 already. That's all right, I give you one. Um, so we're not going with the model that this was maybe a civil war between Jews of... We haven't gotten there yet. More orthodox beliefs, okay. So we, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. No, um, the truth of the matter is this, this class focuses on that question almost every single time. And so I, I just, the, that part of the story has gotten tired for me yet. But point of fact, that people are unaware, the, the way that the war worked out is it was an internal religious struggle, which got wrapped up in the regional politics, and the Jews were fighting each other and pulled the Greeks in to try to sort of tip the scales, each in their own favor. But for our purposes, what, I, what came out of it was an independent kingdom. It took the Maccabees a while, but Simon Hasmonean founded an independent kingdom in the year 140, 145, uh, before the Common Era and indeed freed himself from all taxation of the Greeks, that it was the first independent Jewish kingdom since the first temple had been destroyed. Because the entire second temple period before that had been client state. And the question is, how did it happen that these impassioned religious fanatics who, who fought their way in to the temple, because that was what they wanted to do, <clears throat> reconnect that place where heaven and earth meet? Don't forget, there's got to be somewhere in the world that heaven and earth meet, according to Am Yisrael. There always has to be. And the physical location for that is on the Temple Mount. We'll speak later where other locations might be. Why so, is so why is it so important, Dom Israel? Because that's our task. To unite heaven and earth. As opposed to other peoples who either deny heaven or deny earth, our task is to hold them both and to put them together. We're meant to be the expression of the infinite within the finite, which is what gives hope. Because otherwise you have to abandon the world and think that you're going to be saved by some pie in the sky. Or you have to abandon the potentiality and think that what was dictates what will be and live in a mechanistic universe. We don't want either. So, the Maccabees, I would argue, saw the danger that was coming. By the way, it's a very easy answer. You all know it. How is it possible that they became petty Hellenistic despots? Because the master's house will never be the master's house will never be dismantled by the master's tool. Well said. What? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Actually, the master's tools will never be dismantled. the master's house. I like that. Thank you. That's a, that's a well-turned phrase, and it's directly to the point, right? Uh, meaning that they were carrying the oppression within them. And if you don't do the work of freedom along with liberation, the house you build will look quite familiar. Furthermore, there's a simpler reason, which is power corrupts. Right? The Torah says very clearly in the volume, is the great danger. That to believe that my strength and the power of my hand did this for me, and they work quite well together. They're certainly not a contradiction, because of course the master slave relationship is the ultimate power relationship. But the Maccabees saw it coming. I can prove it to you. You know how I can prove it to you? What was the Avodat Hayom? What was the practice the Maccabees instituted? for the celebration of what became Hanukkah. Don't say lighting the candles, because it wasn't. Eating sukkaniyot. Uh, well, it might have been eat, eating sukkaniyot. That's a whole story we can do some other time. You know the olive pressing season is ending right now, and we all happen to light olive things and eat a bunch of fried foods. But what was it? What else do you do on Hanukkah all eight days aside from light the Hello. candles and eat greasy food? Hollow. Hollow. And we see that that is what the Maccabees mm-hmm. instituted. Eight days of shevach v'hoda'ah, of hollow. And why? In fact, you know, by the way, Halal is bound up with not only this liberation, but every liberation. 
There's a powerful midrash in the Psikta Rabati that asks a question. Lama Korin at the Hallel, why do we read Hallel? It says, Right? It's written in Tehillim, one of the lines in Hallel, right? The Lord is God, He has given us light. Interesting, Hallel has a, has a connection perhaps to, to, to Hila, to, to a certain type of light in the Hebrew language, but it goes further. Well, I'm in Koin Bapurim. Well, okay, if it's such an important thing, why don't we read Hallel on Purim? Well, because in the end of the day on Purim, I'll just paraphrase it, um, we were still slaves to Achash Verosh. Gemar Psachim says it too, if you're familiar. And then it goes on to explicitly say, Ein Koren Ela al Mapalata shall Malchut. You only read Hallel when some kingdom falls. The Omrim, right? And then it puts these words in, in, in um, beautiful, I actually have them here in Paro's voice in another midrash, but the Omrim le Sha'avar, Hainu Avadim le Paro. Right? We say, we used to be, we were slaves to Paro. Right? Avadim li Yavan, or we were slaves to Greece. Bachshav avadav shal kodesh baruch anu. But now we're the servants of God. Right? Halu avdei Hashem. Right? Please praise God, O servants, or give praise, servants of God. Meaning that halal is an expression of a liberation from, but notice what it assumes. That what do you automatically become? A servant of. That there's, that there's no in between. But notice, what happened in between the leaving Egypt and going to Sinai? Between Chofesh and Cherut? What, did I, what word was there? Dror. Dror the, and the song of the Red Sea. And what did the Maccabees place right between the Chofesh and the liberation from Yavan and the Cherut that they longed to gain when the war would be over? Hallel. It's song. Right? Because that is what's meant to orient you toward the positive power of freedom. Because Hallel is meant to fight that problem of Kochi Vozamadi. It's meant to fight the problem that I did this, it's my power, and preserve the consciousness that what it is to be free is to be an Ebed Hashem. All false masters fall away. And the illusion that there is no master was denied by perhaps the most famous Jew of the 20th century, who said, everybody got to serve somebody. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know who it was. He just got the Nobel Prize. If you don't know, you can ask me later. Everybody got to serve somebody. That this idea of negative freedom as an ideal is an illusion. And that what the Hallel represents is that you can choose who you serve. That is how you take Chofesh and you make it into Cherut. And the, that point in the middle where you're at your most dangerous, what do you do when you're in danger? You sing. Just like Israel did coming out from the Red Sea and just like the Maccabees instituted here on Hanukkah. So I do want to say one thing about the modern question of our society today, actually. And then we'll, we'll close out with the other story of light. Um, because I feel that we are dancing on a knife's edge. Seventy years of, of national peoplehood, you know, the number 70 is very evocative. Here at Fridays, we like to talk about the 70 faces of Torah, right? They, it, 70 is a, is a wholeness. There's a wholeness there, which begs the question of what's next. And what I'll tell you in my experience is that what's happening around us, whether it's people's post-Zionism, whether it's their um, skepticism about the future, whatever happened, whatever, I'll tell you at the core, the nostalgia of the return has worn off. Now, how many times have I had the conversation with people who want to know where we're headed and somebody starts talking about, ah, oh, but have you seen, like, it's an amazing story. It is an amazing story from the ovens of Europe to the world's fourth most powerful military, from, from a dispersed, scattered people to a unified culture, more productive, arguably, than any other in the world. It's an incredible story, but you know what? Where's it headed? That's what we all want to know now. The nostalgia of the return is worn off because that's chofesh. That desire to dance naked in the fields and just feel like I'm free 
is really wonderful and not so productive. Right? The question is what Cherut lies ahead. And in that sense, I want to cast um, the Maccabees and their descent into the Hasmonean kingdom and ultimately into you know, a violent dictatorship that killed our sages. In context of Arnold Toynbee's theory of the creative minority. Now, you guys aren't the kind of Jewish crowd that starts to growl at me when I use Arnold Toynbee's name. Well, you are, but that's okay because you're smarter than that. Um, Toynbee was a very famous British historian of the 20th century. And if you want, you can look. He's got a 10 volume, um, what's it called? I forgot already. The, the, his work on, on history is phenomenal. Uh, he was the last of the great historiosophers. He was the last of the great believers that there was some overarching grand narrative to history which could be understood, right? And, but he has a, a whole theory of how society develops. He says, number one, a society develops into a civilization when it's confronted with a challenge that it successfully meets in such a way that leads it on to further challenges. We all know this in our own life. If you're, if you're overcoming and your victories don't lead you to the next challenge, then you'll just spin your wheels and talk about the past for the rest of your life. If you're going to grow, your, your victories have to lead you to the next challenge. He says the ideas and methods for meeting the challenges will always come from a creative minority. And those, those, those ideas will then be adopted by the majority of society. So this is what he calls the theory of the creative minority. right? But if that creative minority fails to command the respect of the majority through the continued brilliance and rightness of their solutions to the next problems and challenges of society, well, then they just become a dominant minority. And they seek to rule through power. Right? This is the essence of Toynbee's theory, but you can sum it up in a nutshell. Be careful, because yesterday's solutions become tomorrow's problems when you look at history. And if you can't be creative, then you can't lead. And if you can't lead, get out of the way. If you can't get out of the way, boy, have a boy for your society. So, there is another side to this story. Because, like Josephus said, the light of liberty lives on. It was an interesting reference, right? We call it lights, perhaps because this liberty came unexpected to us. And, and just like Pesach made us Ben Chorin, wherever we are, and, and you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing to think about throughout history where the Jews have celebrated the Pesach Seder. I mean, what was Pesach like in the Warsaw Ghetto? How free was that? How do you celebrate the festival of freedom when you are conversos <laughs> hiding from the Inquisition in 15th century Spain? I mean, I could go on, but I think you probably get my point. Nevertheless, we were Ben Chorin because we were part of a story that transcended that moment. Again, we were free because we knew what was and even what is does not dictate what will be. And so, Hanukkah unleashes a light that will never die. Right? And, and here is the last piece of the story, which is um, what I like to think of as the postmodern piece of freedom. You know, the Gemara Shabbos says, Kishigavru Yisrael Aoyvehem, the Ibdum, right? When, when Israel overcame their enemies and destroyed them on what day? the 25th of Kislev, right? We came victorious, you all know the story. What happens? We re-enter re the temple, and what do we find there? Come on, guys, you know the story. God, 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 God. We could sing, but we'll do it later, maybe, right? And they, it was only enough for one day, and they, yet they used it to light the set of lamps, and they managed to press olives in pure oil, etc., etc., etc. You know the story. So for Josephus, it was a liberation from the Greeks and the freedom to worship in the temple, just like for the Maccabees. For the Rambam, it was a liberation from the Greeks and the freedom to build a kingdom with the dicey elements of that. And please God, we should be saved by Hallel from becoming that which we reject in seeking our freedom. To the Gemara, it's liberation from the Greeks and the freedom to spread light. But it's not just the freedom to spread light. It's the freedom to believe that the light is there. 
this is the greatest challenge. Because you see what's happening to freedom today. It used to be that in the modern era, negative freedom was enough. Because frankly, when you've experienced depression personally, it's great to be free. Dancing naked in the grass may have gotten old, but it wasn't old for 70 years. And if you've ever felt that intoxicating power of, hey, the cows are Jewish. Wow! You know, like that, and, and if you haven't felt it, then you need to get out and, and let yourself feel it. I can see by the looks of some of your faces, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I can, I can tell you, having grown up as a kid in public school, feeling very strongly my minority status when we sang, oh, I'm sorry, not Christmas carols, um, Halloween carols. That's right, I can, sing you, I can sing you pumpkin bells, pumpkin bells, if you'd like, later. My wife has heard it, she's laughing now. Yeah, she loves it, it's favorite. We do it every winter. We haven't done it yet. Um, so feeling this sense of oppression, or, or learning the history of the Crusades, and going up to my teacher afterwards and saying, that was very interesting, but it's not how I heard the story. Right? That there is a tremendous intoxication in Chofesh. But beware. Because what happens is either the running away from the loneliness and alienation that that Chofesh offers you straight into the arms of fascism, that's what Fromm's book, Escape from Freedom, is about. Because the question that everybody was dealing with in the mid-20th century is how is it possible that the whole arc of Western culture was all about freedom from, freedom from, freedom from, fascism? How does that work? And from his genius is that he's a, a, psycho, he's a, so, a, a social psychologist, thank you. <laughs> and so he was able to take the observations of psychology, apply them to society, and derive very important observations. Right? And what he points out is that actually the biggest challenge that freedom poses is loneliness. And so therefore the solution to it is love, which is probably his most well-known book, which is The Art of Loving. Right? Engaging in positive relationship with your freedom. But not everybody listened, because you know what the other thing that people will do is? They'll tell you that there's no meaning to your freedom at all. Do whatever you want. What, what negative freedom is, is the absolute descent into everybody gets to do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, with whomever they want, why ever they want, wherever they want. Which may sound nice in terms of liberation, but has it given us freedom? And that's part of the darkness that's facing our society today. And if you notice, those two forces are facing off. Fascism, the retreat into a collective sense of security, and the increasing insistence of don't tell me what to do. Right? And what lies between them is something very different. What lies between them is Chirut. And we know what the sages thought of Chirut. So, in order to illuminate pun intended, this aspect of freedom, I really was going to go into Rav Cook, but it's getting late. <laughs> do it, do it. Uh, do it. One, one word from Rav Cook, and, and, and if people are curious, I have, and I'll just do a plug for the Part A students, that this is going to be part of the subject for next semester um, in, in, Rav, in my class in, in teaching Rav Cook's works, but Rav Cook has an incredible perspective on freedom. Now you have to remember, in, in Europe, which is of course where he came from, in 20th century Judaism in general, freedom was a dirty word. Right? What do you call someone in, in Yiddish if you're religious? You're, you're, if you're religious, you're from, right? And what if you've broken the yoke of the Torah and gone your own way, what do you call them? Right. Which means what in Yiddish? It means free. You call them free. Right? Freedom was the opposite of the way that modernity thought of religion. Along comes Rav Cook, and he says, you couldn't be more wrong. He says, Iker Tselem, the essence of the divine image in the human being, who hachovesh agamur she'anam motzim ba'adam, is the complete freedom that you find in a human being. That is what makes you godly. She'alkein hu bal v'chira. And that's because you can make choices. Otherwise, if you weren't free, you couldn't make those choices. And again and again, he will tell you that the Tselem Elohim, the divine image in the human being, is freedom. It's an astounding thing to say for someone who was also the greatest legal authority in the land of Israel in his generation. How could it be? Well, we've already answered that question. 
But I want to deepen it, and there's much more I can say from Rob Cook, but I want to end with a story which I think will explain, because, you know, what is this story of the lights about? I mean, at some point, we were all raised on this story that Hanukkah is about the eight lights, and at some point, somebody comes along, and the, the Grinch that stole Christmas, they tell you there's no tooth fairy, there's no Santa Claus, and by the way, the Jews were killing each other over their inability to reconcile their religious differences, and frankly, the Greeks would have liked to stay out of it. And by the by, nobody knows where this story of the candles came from. <laughs> and then we all go home crying because someone stole the tooth fairy. But the reality is way deeper than that. There's very good reason that the word cherud is not in the Torah. There's very good reason that here in Eretz Israel, people weren't talking about the lights, but we're still obsessed with the national embodiment element of freedom and Hallel. And there's very good reason that it's only in exile that the, that the light of Hanukkah shines the brightest. But in order to explain that, I'm actually not going to tell you about Hanukkah, because there's another story that Gemara tells about light. It's in Gemara Tani, 25a, if you want to look it up later. It's part of a series of very beautiful stories about Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. If you guys know Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, if you don't know Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, you've got to get, you got to get out there and, and, and learn about the Tanayim, right? He tells a story, and this is a story actually we were speaking about it earlier, that I um, actually told at my eldest daughter's baby naming. Was anybody there? Yeah, I'm going to stop, right? Um, might have been. Might have been. We don't know if we... Yeah, who knows? It's a story, but I couldn't remember why it was so important to me in relationship to her, but nevertheless, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So the story goes like this. He comes in Erev Shabbos, and he sees that his daughter is very upset. And it's a part of a series of stories where he notices that the women in his life are upset. Because when Chenina Mendoza used to subsist on one handful of carob seeds from one week to the next. He was not so interested in the material comforts of the world. <laughs> All right? Um, and he saw that she's upset. Amala, biti, biti, lumaya tziva, atzivat. Well, he says, what, what are you so upset about? Amale, kli shechometz nitchalef li bekli shel shem. I accidentally filled our Shabbos candles with vinegar instead of oil. And now, it doesn't say it explicitly, they're, they're going to go out. Right? As soon as that wick, because a wick will burn even without, and then, but as soon as the wick begins to draw vinegar, you'll get a very brief, gross smell. <laughs> and Zehu, you will sit in the dark. Remember, we light our Shabbos candles because it's pretty and we're obligated. For most of history, people lit their Shabbos candles because you want to be able to see when you eat. So what does he say to her? She's very atzuf. Darkness is hard. You try to do the right thing with your freedom. Accidents happen. <clears throat> what do you do then? Did the past now ensure that the present is locked in and that means the future is just simply a mechanistic extension of what you've done? Not to Rabbi Chanina Mendoza. Our law, BT, why is Patlach? He says, what's, what's the difference to you? Misha Amal Hashemin Vidlok, who Yamal Hashemin Vidlok? The one who says to oil, let it burn, will say to vinegar, let it burn. Tanahaya Dolek Holech Kohayom Kulo, Ach Hiriu Mimena Or Vahabdala. And the, the Breita says that it was lit all day until they actually took fire from it for Abdallah. You see the parallel to the Hanukkah story? It burned far longer than anyone would have expected. Because there is an inner freedom which is rooted in the abandoning of all false masters. In the recognition that there's only one world, one God. And that God is a moral force as much as that God is a physical force, as much as that God is a spiritual force. That the God who says what goes up must come down is the same God who told you don't wear wool and linen. And it's the same God who says that oil burns and vinegar does not. And Rabbi Hanin ben Dosa in his tremendous dedication to what was carved onto the tablets, had an incredible freedom. Because he'd gone so far 
in his freedom that there was only one context within which he lived. And that was the will of God. And now I think I understand why his daughter matters here. You know why? Because if she hadn't been there, what would Rabbi Hanina ben Doze have done? Sat in the dark. He would have sat in the dark. That's exactly what he would have done. You know why? Because that's okay too. But he didn't want his daughter to be sad. Because sitting in the dark is hard. And therefore, he and the sages after him, and in fact, every other element of Am Yisrael, for the last 2,500 years, have lit candles. I mean, it's an amazing thing that, that, that the, the Hasmonean Rambam vision of freedom, of the, of the Herut that comes after the liberation from the Greeks, needs a national collective existence in the land, which we're blessed to have. And as I pointed out, we should be blessed to keep it. Let's figure out where it's going. But it's the collective will of the Jewish people that makes the Hanukkah light shine. You can make it shine wherever you are. That is the greatest freedom. So I want to thank you guys for coming. I hope that um, these thoughts should be a Louis Neshama for my father, Salavan Avraham, and should just add a little bit of light to everyone's Hanukkah. Time, time.